everyone. I'm going to uh, start talk today. I'm so happy that there's a lot of us. Um, such a nice day out, but it shows to be here with us. Um, so today we're very honored and happy to welcome Dr. Mala Sarkar from um, McGill University. So she was born in Kolkata, India, to a Ukrainian Canadian mother from Saskatchewan. No. No, sorry. Manitoba. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, and a Bangladeshi Brahmin father who had met as a grad student you'll see, you'll see from the mind. University of Manitoba. That's right. Um, they eventually settled in Toronto, Canada, where she grew up. And so you can imagine how um, she has had lived experiences with issues of heritage versus dominant languages, plurilingualism, pluriculturalism, and hybrid identities, which informed her research interests. Um, so since taking her position at McGill in 2001, she has branched out from mainstream second language education and um, has done research into critical social linguistics inquiry uh, with a focus on empowering minority language speakers through diversification of their communicative repertoires. Um, without much further ado, I'll give it to her. <laughs> that flew! Oh, God, please don't. Don't, don't, don't talk yet. <laughs> so, so a lot of this is kind of the, uh, the story of my life, and I'm, you know, a little bit embarrassed that people want to hear about it. But um, what it is really is a talk about uh, a way to be a researcher that I never anticipated I was going to fall into. And the reason why it might be interesting, although I don't know, uh, is th that some of you are starting out on careers as researchers, and it might be interesting to see how one person did it uh, in a way that isn't kind of not the prescribed way, right? Uh, but it was still, uh, I, you know, fun and, and useful, and it's almost over now because I'm going to retire in less than five years. So, uh, I'm going to go pretty fast because I think that the, the point of all this is for there to be a conversation among the people here and, and, and talk to me and each other, so I don't want to hog all the talking time. And I know that Laura's going to leave and come back and teach her class at six, so that means that by, you know, two minutes to six, we all have to be gone, which means that all the talking time has to happen before then. So, um, and thank you, Angelica, for inviting me. I'm very, you know, honored to be invited and don't really think I deserve to be invited. And I also want to thank the, the Belonging, Identity, Language, and Diversity Research Community. Angelica is here from BUILD, and so are Rhonda and Samantha. And I don't, is in, am I missing anybody? No. John. Oh, John, of course, John, yes. John is newer in it, so I, so, and, and also he's, and Matt, he's, and, our and, and Matt, who is a visiting scholar with Bill, yeah, so Bill is very well represented here, and it's because of Bill that I feel able to, you know, sort of talk about myself in this way, I, anyway, so, so the origins of all this is an elopement that happened in 1955, um, when my parents had to run away to get married, uh, after um, a meeting at the University of Manitoba, and as you can see, uh, they were born in 1932 and 1929, respectively. And I'm going to give you the history of this. And I have very dear friends here who have never seen these family photos, so hopefully they won't mind too much. Uh, but I'm going to go back even further to 1927, when my mother's parents got married in, um, in, uh, in Manitoba. So uh, my grandfather had come from the Ukraine himself. As a, a very uh, as a boy, really, um, he was he was running away from. Um, as okay, he came from the Ukraine in uh, it was around 1906 ish. He was about 14 ish, and he was running away. This was before the October Revolution. This was under the under the Tsar, right? He was running away from Tsarist conscription, uh, and um, and my grandmother was 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 from a family that had immigrated before that, that was already farming in Manitoba. So here's my, my Guido, my grandfather, in one of the many fields of, of wheat and barley and oats and et cetera that he farmed in, in, in Manitoba and, and, and south, south of Winnipeg is where it is. And um, this picture would have been taken in, I think, the 1950s. And the place where he came from in Ukraine actually is kind of similar in terms of being an agricultural area, as many of you would know if you know about Eastern Europe. Ukraine was, has been called the breadbasket of Europe because it's a very agriculturally fertile era, I mean, area full of really good farmers, at least, you know, my relatives all think that they're really good farmers. So, <laughs> so as you see from this map, which is a 2000 map of this part of Europe, 
there's the Ukraine. It's big. There's a lot of really good farmland there. This is, like, this is a substantial country there. But you go back to 1900 when my grandfather was a, a, a little boy. Where is it? It's not here. <coughs> okay, why? Because it was dominated by Russia. So, Tsarist conscription, no independence for Ukraine at that time. A lot of angry young Ukrainians who had lots of reasons to leave. So my grandfather was part of that, that wave of migration. And at that point in Canada, this is like when my mother was young. This is not now. This is when Newfoundland had only just joined, right? That's why the map was made. But you can see that Manitoba is smack in the middle. And for those of you who aren't as familiar, familiar with Canada, which is why I put it in, this is this huge grain growing area all over here. And that's, that's where my mother grew up, like right there. So after they got married, and there they are as a couple, um, you know, they, they raised their family. So there's my mom as a little girl. She would have been about seven then, with her older brother and her two older sisters down on the farm, um, which the family still owns, where I go fairly regularly. And you see her at the age of about 16, you know, with her, with her big brother doing what farm girls do. Did. I mean, this is, <laughs> that's what farming was like then. And, and then she went off, she was the, the all, they actually all went to university, but she was the only one to continue. And she decided she wanted to go to graduate school after her, after her BA. And there were two, um, my father always says there were only two brown guys in Winnipeg, but that's because he didn't know any indigenous brown guys. There were two um, uh, Indian, South Asian graduate students in Winnipeg at the time. He was one of them. And so this is just a warning that you don't know what's going to happen when you're in the same lab as somebody. <laughs> right? So, but of course, when the family found out that they were dating, the fa my mother's family was horrified. And I actually did not allow her to leave for some time because, you know, you need a car to leave that place. She had to run away so they could get married, but no family were present because their family didn't know they were getting married. They told them afterwards. And my, my father didn't tell his family until afterwards either because he knew they would be very upset because he was marrying a non-Bengali who wasn't even from India, who wasn't even Hindu, who wasn't even brown. Like, this was a very bad thing. Biracial couples were not common then. But eventually, he was allowed to, like, they were allowed to visit. But he was never, you know, the family was just never very comfortable. <laughs> and although he's pretending like he knows how to hold a hoe, he doesn't really. <laughs> he never. Bangladesh, but Bengali Brahmins don't do. Is anybody here Bengali and or Brahmin? Brahmin. Okay. Well, do you get down there and dig? Well, only for pleasure. If it's real serious farming, farming yeah. someone doesn't. <laughs> Not all. Anyway, anyway, the Brahmins <laughs> in my family are not very good with tools. And no, they aren't. No, they're not. No, no. <laughs> so they went off to India, and I was actually born there. So here's the family in India, right? And when I came along, then everybody forgave them and wanted to see me. I was, I'm the oldest. And they thought they'd settle in India, but they didn't. They wound up settling in Toronto, where my dad was <coughs> a U of T pro, University of Toronto professor. And I'm rushing through all this, and it'll be all done by, by 5.15, and then we'll have lots of time for you to tell your life stories. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, at that time, you know, biracial families were really not common. And, and so, I'm, so I'm throwing in this anecdote, which I didn't think of before, but when they were looking for an apartment in Toronto in, it would have been about 19, they came back from India, I was two, my sister was born shortly after, it would have been sort of 1960-ish. And they found out very quickly that if there was an apartment for rent and my dad showed up, it had already, it had already been rented. Mm. And my mom showed up, they showed it to her. So, so I got, they probably, she, probably, she probably didn't take me along because I was the wrong color, obviously. So, you know, it was 1960s Toronto. And there the three of us are growing up in Toronto. So there was this family in Toronto, which was a very nuclear family that I was part of. And there were, a couple of relatives from my mother's, like distant cousins. Um, but there was really very little contact with people who spoke the languages that were my parents' first languages, which were Ukrainian and Bengali. But, you know, when we were older, we were able sometimes to go to India to visit. And so this is me with one of my, my aunts in, in Calcutta a long, time, a long time later. 
but this is just to kind of show what the family looks like. Like, there's this family in India, which we didn't see very often. There they are again, right? And, and you know, they're so dark you can't even see them on the, on the slide. And, and, then, and then there's this, that's true. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> the brown person in the room is left. Okay, and, and so, <laughs> And so, and then there's this family in Canada, which I totally love. Like, they're still farming. This is, like, this is one of my favorite cousins in India. And this is my favorite cousin in Canada, Tanya Pankyu, who is a farmer, right? So, th this made us who we are, and, but it, what it meant was that we didn't have a community that we belonged to because both communities basically ostracized us because we were, uh, you know, mixed. My mother was not supposed to do what she did, which was marry a brown guy and have brown kids. And the Bengali community, we were not part of the Bengali community in Toronto, which is actually quite large, because we don't speak Bengali, right? The, our parents brought us up in English, because as you know, you're graduate students, you have a, another first language, which isn't English, but what you speak to your fellow graduate students is the common language, which is English. So the language of our home was English. So because I'm intrigued by language just kind of by nature, I guess, I always felt growing up as if I had been deprived of two cultural birthrights. And it was only when I was putting this slide together that I realized how much it mattered. I, I found a poem by people may know, Rabindranath Tagore, who is the kind of national poet of Bengal. And I can't read it. you know. I, and I found a poem by Taras Shevchenko, who is the national poet of Ukraine. I also can't read it. I mean, I could stumble through because I've learned enough, that, but I wouldn't know what they meant. And I can't understand the poetry. This one's about a flower. And I, I feel like I was robbed of something. And, you know, my sisters don't feel that way. So it, a person doesn't necessarily feel that way, but I felt that way. So. That's why I went into the kind of work I went into, because I was just so linguistically frustrated, right? I would hear my mother talking to her, you know, her family in Manitoba on the phone, or a couple of the older cousins in Toronto and Ukraine, and I couldn't understand anything. My father would occasionally speak to his colleagues or the odd friend who would, you know, visit, or we would visit in Bengali, couldn't understand anything. I, I, just, I, just, I just felt like I should understand, and I didn't. So there was no, you know, feeling of community for us as kids growing up, because we spoke English. And then of course, as somebody growing up in Toronto, from around age eight and grade three, I guess, French as a second language was compulsory. <laughs> somebody else from Bill just came. Bill is very well represented. Um, so so, so um, you have to take, at that time, and probably still, um, you had to start French as a second language in grade three in our schools. And, and I was fascinated by the fact that it was, you know, another language. So I wound up, you know, learning it as well as you can in Toronto core French, which, which if you try, you can sort of do it. And then I, I happened to be in a high school that would, uh, that allowed us to have a bunch of languages. It, in North, it's called North Toronto Collegiate Institute. And so I wound up taking Latin from grade nine through grade twelve. And I could also, I was allowed to take, you could take Russian. That was great, that was really cool. Our high school even offered classical Greek, probably the last high school in Ontario to offer classical Greek, and I took a couple of years. And so, and I couldn't take German and Spanish because you weren't allowed to take that many, but the high school offered those. I was just like, languages, yes, I want languages. And then when I got to the equivalent of Sejep, which, which was at a, a different school in a different province, it offered Mandarin Chinese, so I took Chinese for um, the two years I was there, and then I went on, then I got to McGill, and kept on with Chinese, and wound up going to China as uh, an exchange student in 1982-83, uh, when most of you were not born. <laughs> Some of you were. Uh, and that was super interesting. So, you know, it's like, but the why? Because it was another language, an even more different language, that wasn't Indo-European, because of course all of these ones are Indo-European. All these other ones are Indo-European languages. So. Uh, I, and I had a chance to take Bengali classes, and I actually and I learned a bit of Bengali, not enough. But and then I wound up getting as a married to a Quebec francophone. It's like you know, interview. You know, you have money in the bank. Do you speak another language besides English? Yes, tech, tech. Okay. Do we like the same kinds of drink? No. no. I mean, I mean, he's a wonderful guy, and but I, I think that him being from a different background and different language, 
was part, probably part of the attraction. You don't know when you're, you know, 25. So we wound up, we wound up, and I think so, you know. Uh, we wound up, you know, living here. Now you're all asking yourselves about your relationship. And at the moment, I don't know, really, you know. At the moment, the other language in my life is my Spanish-speaking son-in-law who is from Mexico City. So that's another whole story, but um, as I got started on, you know, being a career academic, I was also raising the kids. So this is my daughter. Some of you know her. This is my son. Some of you know him. And this is, and this is actually the, the Mexican boyfriend. They were married at that point. So they grew up bilingual English, French, and Montreal. I was really adamant that they should be balanced bilinguals, all that one parent, one language stuff worked. And at the same time, and this is the other origins part, Here's Patsy, who, of course, some of you know extremely well. So this is, this is, off, this is from Patsy's um, uh, website that is post-retirement, right? And she looks fabulous, and, and this, this is a piece about her. So Patsy, Patsy Lightbound, uh, who was at Concordia until she retired in, I think, 2001, um, was my supervisor, and Laura Collins' the supervisor, which is why we're buddies ever since. <laughs> and that... That made me the kind of academic I am in many ways because it was an excellent training because Patsy was a superb supervisor. It was a, 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 an approach to second language acquisition research that is still a core piece of, of who I am as a, as, a, as a researcher, although now there are lots of other pieces besides that one. But at the same time, I, I, I had and have I, like a need for community because I didn't have one growing up, really. And it happens that in, um, in Montreal, there's something called the South Asian Women's Community Center. And uh, I, if this works, I, it might work. Yes, I'm, so I'm going to see if I can go online. Is that OK? Yeah. Because is Shan still here? Yeah. Or did she have to leave? Oh, oh, there you are. OK, <laughs> because you were interested in seeing this. So, so uh, oh, OK, right. Oh, does that, but then it doesn't, oh. Move it. Have to move it. Will it move? I don't know if it will move. I don't know if I can move it. No. Oh, I would have to. I would have to. Oh yeah, you can drag it. Can drag it. Can drag it? Can I drag it to the right? Or the other way? Ah, okay. So here's. Sorry. So here's. Oh, and I'll just leave it there, and I'll come back to the. I think it will work. But so this is the website for the South Asian Women's Community Center, which has been redone quite recently and is really lovely now. I mean, it was, it, was, it was okay before, but this is better than what it was before. And so all you have to do if you want to find out about this particular community center is Google SAWCC, which stands for South Asian Women's Community Center, and then CCFSA, which stands for Centre Communautaire des Femmes Sud Asiatiques. So then we come up immediately, and, and the site is really good. And we have been um, uh, serving women of South Asian origin in the Montreal area since for 38 years. You know, most women's centers fold after about a year and a half. So, so being part of this community, now I'm going to see what happens if I click back on here. Yes! That's exciting. Okay, and then can I just go back here and click? I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, so, you know, there I am in the middle. And we're all being very activists. So, so they, uh, the, this particular, you know, group of women of South Asian origins have been a really important part of my community. Uh, ever since I arrived in Montreal because, you know, you don't have to be one origin. You don't have to be just Bengali. You can be half Bengali and have something else. You don't have to be uh, you know, an immigrant. You can be, a, 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 I'm, I'm like, I'm actually technically an immigrant, but I'm more like a, a second generation person because I grew up completely in Canada. So you can be second generation, you can be first generation, you can be 1.5, you can be from any, you can actually be from anywhere and be a member. So they have been an, a very key part of my, my, my life as a, as a, as a researcher, but also just in my community here. And what wound up happening was because I had such a great connection with SOC and I was volunteering, you know, doing ESL teaching and administra administration stuff, I had, uh, I had uh, like links to the, to the Bengali community that completely um, uh, determined the course that my thesis work took. So, uh, Laura, will <laughs> remember when we were doing this, like we were doing our theses together. So I wound up looking at Bangladeshi children in 
um, Classe d'accueil, um, welcome class kindergartens in Montreal. And there were um, a couple of dozen of them that I talked to and was trying to find out about their French. But because I wanted to talk to their families as well, I had a helper who Patsy kindly funded for me, who went with me to homes and interviewed families with me sort of taking notes because I could understand but not speak. So it became not technically a, a project with that community, but it became a project in which many members of the South Asian community were involved because there were two um, Bangladeshi women helping me and then there were a bunch of people at the, at the center helping me. And I, and I, did, and I thought I was going to go on doing that. that. You know, and, and I and I wound up doing very different things. But this is just to make the point that you can that you can sort of publish in one area and then then leave it behind and publish in very different areas. But it, the, the work still stands. I mean, this this is just to make the point that it led to stuff that I that I enjoy doing, even if I'm not doing it anymore. So so and the community that that uh, that grew up around Patsy Lightbound and Nina Spada, who was at McGill, and they've both now left those places. Um, ha is a community that has gone on. So many of you here are members of the, the, the SLA research group, which meets in this room every couple of weeks, usually through the academic year. And here's one of the meetings that we had uh, in December when a colleague from Hong Kong came through McGill's, this program that McGill has, and he came and gave a talk here, and here's me and Laura and Susan Ballinger, who is my colleague at McGill now. So this is just to say that this community has been a really important community. The, the, the community that, that forms around your academic life is not just an academic community. It's also a community of friends. And that has been very, very important. But at the same time, so now we're, it's, we're, now we're, we're back in you know, the year 2000 or so, Parenthood takes you some very strange places, <laughs> right? So uh, my son was, my kids were growing up and my son was interested in hip hop and he became a rapper, you know, an amateur rapper. Amateur rappers produce um, CDs in their parents' basements. <laughs> that's what they do. But this was one time when they were actually on stage, so that's, that's my little boy. <laughs> when he was about, I don't know, 17 or something. And because he, um, uh, knew that a way to hook me on, like to not disapprove too much of the way the music sounded, because I don't really, you know, I'm not crazy about the way it blocks it sounds, but it's really loud. But, but anyway, but it's linguistically extremely interesting. So Montreal hip hop uh, became the focus of my research life for a good 10 years. And it became, you know, something that I was able to with colleagues, get grant funding for, and and write about, and present about, and and I actually we became part of a kind of a worldwide community of people doing research on multilingual rap, and how cool is that? I never I never saw that one coming. So we worked with um, uh, Treizième Etage, which is a uh, they're no longer uh, together, but they were important at the beginning. This is my son's crew of three, right? They, they call themselves Rien Appel. They call themselves other things too. But a group, the group that we probably worked with the most is called Nomadic Massive. And Nomadic Massive is still around. Do people know Nomadic Massive? Okay, oh cool, all right. So Nomadic, it, in, I mean, I'm sure it's all different, pe it's not all the same people as it was in 2007. It's probably quite a few different people now. But they are a very interesting hip hop crew. Of at that time, I think it was uh, 11 people that were from nine different origins, and they rapped in English, French, Haitian Creole, Spanish, Arabic, and and other um, Caribbean Creoles, and they were just absolutely fascinating to to study the work of. But they were also all you know really smart young people who were mostly interested in doing a master's at some point. So several of them who worked on their MA work, um, we were able to hire them as research assistants. And as soon as we started hiring rappers to interview rappers, we got really different results from when it was you know, McGill University professors sitting down with rappers who were being very polite with us. But with another rapper, I mean, they, they were, they just opened up way, way more. And it became, it became a, a collaborative project where the, Research assistants 
um, were not just research assistants, but they were co-researchers because they had way better ideas than, than my two colleagues at McGill and I did about what direction the interview should take and what we should be looking for when we were interviewing rappers. So that, that just became a, 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 a project that I was thrilled to be part of. And I'm, and I'm going to run through a few slides from one of the presentations from that project, e even though I know some of you might have seen them before, but just to give you an idea what it looks like when you do this. So um, Bronwyn, who I worked with, who I still work with sometimes, and Lise Weiner, who is now retired, and people who you might know who helped us. This, this, that got presented where? New Zealand in 2007. So we were looking at um, uh, the functions of code switching in the actual lyrics. Uh, we were looking at how the, how the rappers perform hybrid identities. Um, which, uh, because they had very interesting, um, weird combinations of ethnic origins in their background. We were looking at this as a model for community and belonging in Quebec, where being uh, a, a member of the hip hop community is an identification for a lot of young people, and still, still it is. If you're, if you're, if you do hip hop, you know this. Uh, so, you know, if you would ask people, you know, where do you feel like you, who are you, where do you belong? They, belo they, they belong in hip-hop rather than in Quebec or in Montreal. Hip-hop is their identity. So that's extremely important for a lot of young people. And we thought that, that that was an interesting thing. And a lot of what we were finding was that using language in certain ways that involved a lot of um, kind of illicit because it's not approved of, language mixing was part of their identity as, as, as artists, as creative artists. So, so a group that, that does that now that you might have heard of, that has a new uh, show or CD out, I think is Dead Obies. People probably know Dead Obies. They came along after we had <coughs> stopped doing this work. But they, they have cited our work and some of their work which is kind of cool. So, so they are also deliberately, consciously um, breaking the language rules here, because the Quebec language rules are so strict, right, about keeping languages in separate boxes. And what they do is they say, no, we're going to break the rules. It's like, so sue us. So that, that's, that's that. And they do it extremely well. And so do, so do you know, nomadic masses. So we're, we were looking at, at that as what we thought might, might quite likely be an agent of social and linguistic transformation in this particular youth community. Which, you know, it's not all people their age, but it's certainly uh, a, 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 not a, a much noticed and, and, and sort of mediatized and important youth group. So challenging these categories like Francophone and Anglophone and Allophone and celebrating multilingualism. So um, it's been a long time since I presented on a hip hop project, so I thought it might be fun to just look at one very short clip, um, which I'll play for you. This, I think this is going to work. Yes, it should work. So uh, the the group is is called um, uh, the group is called uh, Musion, but I think they've all moved on to other things now. And J Kill is the rapper, and J Kill is, is 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 a woman, so it's unusual to have. A female rapper of Haitian origin. She's not. She's not like. She's not performing uh, sexuality at all. She's just being a rapper. She, she, and and but her her lyrics are often very feminist. And this is an, a good example of a feminist lyric, um, be, because she what it what it, the story it tells is that she's on the dance floor and a guy that she doesn't like at all is trying to like move in on her, and she's you know repulsing him and telling him to get lost. Um, uh, and 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 uh, uh, telling me smells bad and stuff like that, and and also she's she's uh, she's um, doing things that are like I forget who the American Roxy Brown I think uh, she's doing things that Roxy Brown does in some song of hers. Anyway, so uh, when we sat down to analyze it, we f f detect nine different varieties of language in this one little short piece. Um, including different varieties of French, different varieties of English, Caribbean Creoles. Uh, there's even a word from, um, uh, 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 I think it's uh, 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 an indigenous Brazilian language that has come into Portuguese or something, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. which means 
Ash. Bum? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if it was my grandchildren, I would say, no, we don't say that, we say bum. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is a fast rap. So, so, so you really have to, you have to pay attention. Oh, okay, we do it again. Okay, it's a fast rap, so you really have to pay attention, so. This is, this is 30 seconds out of a song that lasts about three and a half minutes. And it's all like that. So it's very impressive. She's really, really talented. She, she has an MA in um, literature focusing on, on poetry from the University of Montreal. So anyway, so we did that for a while. We had a, we had a absolute wonderful time doing that. We, we offended some, some nationalist francophones for sure, which was also fun. Uh, and, and, uh, but we're trying to make a point about, la about French in Quebec being a language that is evolving. Because any language that is alive in the, in the, in, on the lips of, of real speakers is going to evolve. And so we're making this point that you know, languages like these ones are going to be important in the future of Quebec French. And that has to be, um, that has to be okay. Because there's no point getting all upset about it since it's happening. Right? Anyway, so, um, so the, that work led to a lot of uh, output because it lasted for a while and it was funded. So there's like papers and, and, and stuff. So if you're interested, you know, let me know and I can. So, so then, at the same time, while I was doing this, I was invited to be part of a grant application with an indigenous community, which is Lissagouj Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq First Nation in Eastern Quebec, in the Gaspé. Some people may know that part of Quebec. And these are the women that I worked with for, for over 10 years, Marianne Metallic and Janice Vicker, who are teachers of their own language in, in their own community. And what happened was that the daughter of this lady was our PhD student, and she came to us at McGill to, uh, to say, my mother is working on a way of teaching our language to our young people who ha had lost it, and it seems to be working better than other methods worked in the past or than, the, than, than what the school is doing, but they really could use you know, res uh, funding help, so what, maybe we could apply for a grant or something. So I became part of grant applications to, to help with the, 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 the language teaching work out there, which was um, it, uh, amazing. It's completely changed my life as a researcher, like, completely. So, um, so uh, I'm not presenting what they did because I no longer feel comfortable doing that. I, I don't think it's my story. I think I should tell my part of it, but not their part of it. So what I have presented on it um, this was in 2015, I think, in, in this kind of way where I talk about how I fit in. But again, I feel like this is too navel-gazing, so I don't want to do too much of it. So I'll sort of skip rapidly through this. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, that's right, 2015. Um, and go on to just, just give you a tiny bit of background. So Because this was a community that is a very, very solid community. And it's like, here, uh, here I am looking for community. Oh, well, I'm actually never going to belong to that community, but I am allowed to come and, and, and watch and get to know people. And there's, you know, a non-Indigenous researcher working with an Indigenous community has to be very aware that they're not a member of the community. So it's a way to learn about community by not being a member, which is not very easy, actually, but was very valuable. So um, what they have been doing is, uh, uh, is, is teaching um, uh, people in the parent generation, because the problem with a lot of indigenous languages, as many of you probably know, is that intergenerational transmission has been broken. So the, the very elderly great-grandparents and grandparents are still fluent. So the ladies I was working with, they, they are still fluent. Their generation is mostly still fluent. But the generation of their children, including our PhD student, but she's an exception, she's, she's fluent. But in her generation, people don't speak it which means that they don't speak it to their children, which means that the children don't speak it. So that's why the languages are so endangered now. Uh, this, is, this is where the community is. So here's Montreal. So it's about a nine and a half, ten hour drive. And this is the border between Quebec and New Brunswick. Here's the Gaspé Peninsula. Here's New Brunswick. So um, 
Uh, the, the method, the language teaching method, and here, I mean, we, we could talk for hours about this, but we won't, but uh, it, it uses images that are very carefully chosen, that are not random at all, that are sequenced in a particular way that maps the grammar of the language onto images in an array. So you'd have to know more about the grammar to understand how that makes sense. But, so, like, these are animate nouns, um, the, uh, the animate singular nouns, animate plural nouns, inanimate singular nouns, inanimate plural nouns. This is the first teaching sequence. And so it's completely visual and what you, 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 you may notice, here's Janice you know, pointing something out, these students have no papers or pencils on their tables at all. You don't need to use writing. It's, it's an incredibly complicated grammar which people learn there without needing to use writing at all. And, and that is a huge accomplishment, um, especially when you consider that like many indigenous communities, the history of a lot of people with schooling in this community has not always been happy, right? The legacy of residential schools, and Indian day schools, like schools, maybe not good for us, right? So, so moving away from an emphasis on, on reading and writing, which is seen as this you know, kind of European white settler phenomenon, has been one of the advantages of that method. And here you see again that the learner you know, doesn't have any papers or pencils. And you see, oh, this, this is the, one of the titles we used for, a, I think, a conference presentation, which kind of shows you uh, that this is a polysynthetic language. Uh, where words are made up of many, many, many bound morphemes all, all glued together in a certain way that cannot be varied and that is incredibly complicated to learn. So a word in, in Enigma is like a sentence in English, right? So and I can explain that if you like later. But I'm, I have to move on because I really want there to be time for questions. So uh, here's uh, Janine, our student, who's, who's now my colleague at McGill. So that's amazing. So I I'm, you know, stepped back because she's taken it over. Um, but uh, what I learned from this project was this line out of a really good paper by somebody called Christina Era, who works with uh, Aboriginal and uh, Australian languages, uh, that my methodology was sit down, shut up, and listen. <laughs> like, get out of the way. Don't tell them what the research project is about, because you don't know. And that was very hard to learn, especially given that Patsy had trained me very well to think that I probably should direct the research project. And the kind I was doing then I was okay to direct. This kind, it was not okay to direct. So I've, I've learned so much about being a different kind of research, kind of researcher uh, in, in this new kind of web of relationships. So we went on, the project went on, it went on the road, it, went, it turned into a nurse, a junior kindergarten age four immersion project at one point. And, uh, and I'm not going to show much more of it because I don't have much time, but uh, what is very encouraging is that uh, they were teaching adults with this picture method on the wall, and they were also teaching children, and now the immersion is in the school there, and it's up to grade four now. So that you, you, you implant immersion year by year with, you know, as the cohort gets older, as you know. So this cohort of, uh, of four-year-olds here, uh, this young man is the dad of this little girl here. And this was when you know, they both knew enough that they could try to use it in their home. Mm -hmm. So it's starting slowly. You don't know if it will work, but it has to start like that. There's no other way to start it. So maybe there's hope for intergeneral transmission. That's so exciting. But now I'm going to say goodbye to Lestiguch. This is, this is Lestiguch. This is the town. See how beautiful the place is. So that was amazing, but it's over now because the indigenous researcher who was a PhD student and research assistant, quote unquote, she wasn't really an assistant, uh, on the project for years is now my colleague, which is as it should be. But it led to a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, presenting and publishing and everything, and also meant that I got the kind of rug pulled out from underneath me and never really thought that I actually knew anything after that, which was a good thing because I was overconfident before. I went fishing and caught a fish from one, one time. That was great. So, that, so, and, and I, they made me wash it and, 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 and open it up and clean it and everything. And, and then, then I said, what am I going to do with this? I can't cook it in my motel room. So we decided <laughs> that I would give it to the chief. So we went around to the chief's office, at the chief's house. The chief is a woman. She took it and said, oh, good. I'll take this for supper. It was, it was great. It was really great. So, 
what's happening now is like I'm going, okay, well, I don't think I actually know very much, but I'm part of a community, or I'm looking at a community, or I'm, there's a community, and I want to um, be with them and figure out what it is I can learn from them. Like, that's kind of how BUILD happened, right? So BUILD, which several people here are, you know, amazing contributors to and members of, started in 2013 as an idea, and then it started as a blog in 2014. And I, th I think I made this, yes, okay. So I, if, if I click on this, something should happen. I'm not sure what. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, so you, that's our landing page? How about that? But I don't know if I can, oh, I don't know, can I move the mouse over? So yeah, I thought I could, oh yeah, I can't, I, the, the problem is, all right, so then if you click on here, you come to our blog. <coughs> And we started in 2014, and our most recent post is one by Sunny Lau, who is Angelica's friend, who Angelica brought in to build, because I didn't know Sunny, but Angelica did, and she's out at Bishops. And this is a really, really one, I mean, this is our, the post that just went up, you know, on Sunday, and it's about her kid learning, Canton, learning to write in Cantonese. It's just this amazing post. I look, look at that image. Anyway, so we, we um, are a collective blog. So there's one post a week, and we kind of take turns writing the posts, and then sometimes there's guest bloggers. So Matt did a guest blog for us, but he's also, uh, he's our permanent guest member for as long as he's always welcome to come back whenever he's here. So we did the blog, but we also, now it's, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, can I do this? The problem is, I'm not, okay, if we go back to here, um, we also, a couple of years ago, so, so, so it's, it's very, it's, it's unstructured in the sense that there's nobody sort of in charge of it. We all do it, really. Everybody's not it. Yes, Sarkar, don't get above yourself. So, so I, so, but then one of us decided a couple of years ago that we should start a journal. And we did, and we have a journal. And this is it, like, it's a real journal. It's a real online, it, it doesn't have paper copies, it just has, um, uh, well not just, it has an online edition. But it's, but it's gradually, you know, building up steam, it's been around for two years now, and it's so much fun, although it's a lot of work actually, to, to, to be part of a new journal, which is um, interesting in the, in, the, in the field because we eschew, which means we spit on, the model of, um, uh, blind peer review, which we're calling anonymized peer review, because blind is ableist, and not nice to people who can't see very well. So, so instead of having peer, uh, blind, uh, that kind of peer review, we have what we call a peer mentoring, which is the model that the Canadian Journal of New Scholars and Education has. So we're, we, we got the model from them. So uh, the peer mentors who we pair with the authors develop a relationship with them, and they, you, know, you know who the other person is, and you work together. And I think it works really, really well. And I've, I've peer mentored several people and been peer mentored once. And it's, it's, it's so, so different from the usual, um, you know, you get, this, you get the, the letter back and it says really terrible things about your paper and you don't know who it was, and you want to kill that person. <laughs> so, 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 oh yes, and, wait, wait a minute, wait, I have, to, I have to go back to, I have to go back to, okay, how do I go back here? I don't know, I want to go back to here. Oh yeah, okay, right. And it's led to <laughs> it's led to scholarly exchange between universities that has been incredibly <coughs> fulfilling, right? So you know, Angelica, as soon as she arrived in Montreal, we said, "You have to be a member of Bill," and she said, "Okay," <laughs> and she came and did one of our talks. So you know, and this is just a sh and th these are the oh you can't see because it's uh, anyway. What's happening now is that Angelica and I have been invited to co-host. Um, the uh, multi multidisciplinary approaches to language policy and planning conference, which is actually an international conference, but it's located in Canada. So that's happening um, here next year, and it's because of Bill. Because right? I, there's no way we could have done it without the support of people who are going to do all the work behind the scenes. So, and and this is the abstract that we submitted this year. So Angelica is on it. Samantha is on it. I'm just organizing it because I don't, you know, anyway. So work with the build community is, is like a work in progress, right? It's not finished, <coughs> and it hasn't led to very many publications, but it's so fun, and I love blogging, 
And it's led to all these interesting things like an invitation to co-host a conference where we've written a grant application. We're probably going to write lots of more grant applications so that we can actually get some money to fund you know, things like uh, our technical support and stuff. So the, I never thought that would happen. And it's a, that, that's a community which is an academic community, but not only. Okay, so it has its roots back in what Patsy and Nina organized. It's like that, except it's much less hierarchical, which I think is really, really good. I, I love that. Um, and now I, I'm looking forward to retirement because you know there's lots of people around to learn from, and some of them are really young. So these are all the grandchildren who have come along in the past few years. Few years, <laughs> the, the baby only was born last year, so she wasn't in this picture. She's not after she's turning one soon, and I don't know where they're going to lead me, but it's going to be somewhere exciting and fun, and you have to kind of just go with it and trust that you know the community will be there for you. And from not having a community at all as a little kid to having all these communities now has been a huge gift, and you're you know allowing me to come here and tell you that. That's that's. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So that's 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 just really thank, thank you.